Hello my dear sewing friends, it's Elisa here and in this video I would love to share with you 10 very quick and easy sewing projects that are also useful. You can make them for yourself, you can make them as gifts and these are really great for using those small fabric scraps that you have. I also love that these provide a really good practice for your sewing skills. It's a win-win all around. So without any further ado, let's get started and I hope you will enjoy. So this first project is great because you can make it in both knits and woven. So I'll show you both of the options. And we're going to start by measuring your head circumference. Going to take your measuring tape, place it like so, bring it around, place your finger where it starts to overlap, take it off, Mine reads 23 and a half inches. So I will go for 20 inches as a one side of the rectangle and nine inches as the other. 20 inches because we want this to be a little bit smaller so that way it will sit nicely on your head. Now this is a nice remnant of rib knit that I have and please note that some knits stretch less than others. So if your knit isn't as stretchy then the long side of your rectangle should be closer to the measurement of your full head circumference. The direction of the greatest stretch will be along the longest side of your rectangle. Let me put this on my ironing mat so that way you can see a little bit better. And our first step is going to be to sew the long sides. So we're going to place it like so, right sides together, and then sew it. You can do it on a serger or on a sewing machine by using a zigzag stitch. Don't forget to backstitch at the beginning and at the end. Now this is what we're going to have once done. If your seam has a little bit of waviness in it and if your knit is made from natural fibers that can withstand the heat, then you can give it a quick little press to remedy that. After that, I'm going to turn this right side out and center the seam right in the middle. Now flip it, bring the other end and offset it like so. Take it into your right hand, fold it around, and fold it around. Pin and sew over this. Now just to mix it up, I will complete this particular seam on my serger, but you can of course do that on a sewing machine as well. However, you might feel that your sewing machine isn't going as smooth simply because there are so many layers sandwiched together. So in order to make this a little bit easier, choose a bigger zigzag stitch that should help. And if it doesn't, if the sewing machine refuses to go through the layers, then you can simply use a hand sewing needle and a blanket stitch to finish up that little part. It will only take you a couple of minutes and you won't see that seam because it's going to be hidden on the inside. Once the seam is done, I'm going to tuck in all of the thread ends. I also like bringing these two ends together and quickly tacking them with a hand sewing needle and thread and you will see why in just a minute. Now let's turn this right side out. There we go. And all that is left to do is to try it on and enjoy. And ta-da! <laughs> there you have it. Now this could be just a simple headband. This could be an ear warmer for winter time. This could be a thing that you wear when you get ready in the morning. So many different uses. And I know that mine uh, might be considered a little bit boring in terms of color. So choose a bright print and have fun with it. Alright, now let's make a similar one with a fabric that has no stretch. So I'm going to choose some really pretty fabric scraps over here. And now let's take a look at what we need to cut out. Now I do have a pattern for this project and if you are a member of this channel, I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart and you can find this pattern in the templates folder as a part of your membership. Now if you are not a member of this channel, then you can see the measurements right now on your screen and you can definitely make your own. So I will need to cut out four of these, adding quarter of an inch seam allowance all around as I cut this fabric and I will need to cut out one of these, but this pattern piece is on a fold. Again, I will need to add seam allowances all around the edges and I will do quarter of an inch. Now let me show you, I have cut my pattern pieces, but I didn't have enough of one color. Maybe that's for the best. So I've cut one side yellow, the other one 
pink. Now I've also cut the other pattern piece. Remember it was on the fold. So here it is. The first thing that we're going to do is sew the long ones. We're going to place them right sides together and sew along all of the edges except for the short one with a quarter of an inch seam allowance. Alright, I'm done with the first one. Now we're going to grade some of the seam allowances, especially around the curves, turn it right side out and give it a really good press. If you have a skewer or a knitting needle with a somewhat blunt tip, that usually helps with turning out any of those little corners. If you'd like, you can give it a row of top stitching right on the edge all the way around. When it comes to this pattern piece, we're going to place it right side up like so and then bring the long ends together. Now we're going to stitch it with a quarter of an inch seam allowance with a straight stitch. Next we're going to turn it out and then grab elastic. Elastic should be about half an inch, five eighths of an inch wide and we're going to cut six inches. Use a large safety pin to help you out with this next step. Place elastic inside of the tube and line up one end of the elastic with one end of the tube. Then I like to bring it over to my sewing machine and stitch over it multiple times, about a quarter of an inch from the edge. Then bring the other end of the elastic to the other end of the tube and repeat all the same steps. Now the last and final step is to connect all three. Let me show you on this side how it's going to look like when it's done. Here you see the elastic is attached, all of the raw edges are tucked in on the inside, nice and neat. So take this longer piece, flip it, take your elastic, place it right in the middle, left side is going to go first, so fold it over, like so, then the right side, fold it over, hold the sandwich, and stitch over it with a straight stitch about a quarter of an inch away from the edge. Once done, take the elastic and pull until it all flips right side out nice and neat. Then I like to secure it one more time, also with a straight stitch, this time about 3 eighths of an inch away from the edge, so that way everything is tucked inside. And now all that is left to do is to tie it and these narrow areas are left here specifically for that so that way it's a little bit easier to tie a really nice knot and once you're done you are good to wear it. It definitely has a very vintage vibe to it in my case, I think that the colors do look juvenile, but obviously that's what I chose for this demo, so you will choose your own colors, but I wanted to give you two extra tips. As always, the choice of fabric really matters. So here I was working with 100% cotton, more like quilting cotton, so quite a stiff material to work with in terms of drape and structure. But if you choose something that's lighter, for example, drapey blouse weight rayon or cotton voile, which is definitely lighter than quilting cotton, then you will get a headband that is much softer in the look. The second tip is that if you need to vary this in size, you can simply adjust the length of both of the pattern pieces right in the middle of the pink fabric and of the elastic. So for example, I'm actually going to remake this for my little one. So I will undo one of the sides and decrease the length of the pink tube and the elastic inside of it. All right, I think we're ready to move on to the next project. This is a very quick and easy project and very useful one because when you vary this in size, you can make these for a lot of different uses. For example, a shoe bag, a laundry bag, or a gift bag. So many different ways how to use this up and make something useful. Start by gathering your fabric scraps and cutting out three pattern pieces. You can see the dimensions for them on your screen. 
That's what's going to give you a little bag that we're going to be making today in this video. But of course, you can come up with your own measurements as well. Uh, this is what I have for my bag and we're going to start working with the smallest pattern piece. First, we will need to fold in the edges about a quarter of an inch once and then quarter of an inch twice, then go to the sewing machine and stitch it down. And we're going to repeat that on both sides. Once done, this is what we're going to have. Now I'm going to fold it in half and cut through the folded side. Next, I'm going to grab one of the large pattern pieces. I'm going to take the small one that we just made, fold it in half, and then center it right here on top. At the sewing machine, I'm going to stitch it down with 3 8 of an inch seam allowance with a straight stitch. If it's easier for you, of course you can pin it first and then sew it. And don't forget that we will need to do this on both pattern pieces. After this, we will need to finish the raw edges up top and you can do it two ways. On the sewing machine, using tightly spaced zigzag stitch, an overcast stitch, or perhaps you want to do a really, really tiny flat well seam. That is an option as well. Or you can do it on a serger. After that, we're going to flip these parts up. Then place these right sides together. And right here on the edges, there should be plenty of space for you in order to construct a 3 8 of an inch seam. Let's pin it. And now we're going to sew it with a straight stitch from here all the way down, pivot, all the way here, pivot, and all the way up. When pivoting, leave the needle down and then turn your project so that way you get a nice and clean corner. Once done with a straight stitch, we will also need to finish the raw edges of the seam and I'll be using a serger just like in a previous step. As an alternative, you can do a French seam on the inside so that everything is nice and enclosed, but you will need to leave larger seam allowances in order to complete it. At this point, the bag is done and now we can turn it right side out. In order to get nice sharp corners, fold the seam allowance down like so and to the side. Now, turn out the corner and you will get a nice 90 degree corner and let's do that on the other side as well and you can leave this as is and give it a good press and then move on to the ties but I like to do one extra step. With these seam allowances facing down I like to give it a quick top stitch from one side all the way around. The goal here is to catch the seam allowance underneath so don't stitch too far away from the seam. And also, since we're going through so many layers, you might want to increase the length of your straight stitch so that way it's a little bit easier to go through them. Once done, let's tidy up any of the loose threads, tuck them in and give it a good press. And after that, we'll move on onto the last and final step which is going to be making the ties. Option number one is to use ribbon or twill tape. You will need two pieces and I will cut each one of them to be about 22 inches long. Take one of the ribbons, place it like so, and one end is gonna go in here and the other end is gonna go in here, creating a little loop on the side, just like you see over here. Next, we're going to repeat exactly the same steps on the other side. But this one is going to be a little bit more challenging because we already have a tool tape or a ribbon in, but it's totally doable. So, one end is going to go in here and the other one is there, creating the loop on the opposite side of the other loop. Now I'm going to grab the open ends on both sides and tighten up, up like so, and then tie a knot with two ends in it. You will, of course, will need to repeat the same steps on the other side. Option number two is to cut two strips of the same fabric, each one about 22 inches long and an inch and a quarter wide. To create the tie, you would need to fold the edges evenly to the middle, then fold it one more time and then stitch on the edge. Now the ties aren't cut on a bias, but if you do have a bias tape maker, use it in order to make the process go faster. Once you have sewn your ties, you're going to thread them through the casings exactly the same way as we did with the twill tape or ribbon. And that's it, your little bag is done. Project number four is a sweet little zipper pouch that you can make in two sizes and beyond. You can come up with your own size and this is a great project where to practice your skills when it comes to installing a zipper. So if you've been really, really scared of doing zippers, this is the time to conquer it 
and definitely make it work. Now to get started on this project, of course, you're going to need your fabric scraps. I'm using mostly cotton, some linen, some cotton linen blends. All of them are woven, no stretch. Then you will also need an assortment of zippers, just depending on how many of the zipper patches you would like to make. And then of course, some type of interfacing to make it a little bit sturdier. So in my case, I'm going to be using this fusible fleece that I had left over from this little bag basket project that I did this past Christmas. The first step for me is to sort out the fabric scraps and find large enough pieces in order to cut out the template for my taco pouch. Now you can see the measurements for this template right now on the screen, but if you are a member of this channel, first of all, thank you so, so much for your support. I truly appreciate you. And then you do have the template for the large one and for the small taco pouch available as a part of your membership. All of these measurements already include seam allowances for the taco pouches. Here I have my inner fabric, my outer fabric, and my fusible fleece interfacing. Now let's give them a really good press and fuse this piece to the outer fabric. While we're at it, let's grab a little leftover fabric, about seven inches by two inches. First, we're going to fold it in half, give it a really good press, and then we're going to fold in the raw edges. This is going to create those little tabs on the bottom of the pouch. Now that you have folded it in, give it another really good press so that way it's easier for us to stitch. This is the sandwich that we're going to be working with. Let me show you the final result of this stage. So this one is already quilted, so that's one of the things that we will need to do. We're going to attach the little tabs and perhaps a little label as well. To do the quilting, I'm going to grab my ruler and heat erasable pen. You can also use chalk or washable marker. And then I'm going to draw the lines. All of them are going to be parallel to each other. After I have completed marking my quilting grid, I will add just a couple of pins to hold everything together. And after that, I will head to the sewing machine to complete the actual stitching lines. To do this, I'm using just a regular straight stitch, starting with the back stitch and ending each line with the back stitch as well. But I did increase the stitch length just by a tad to make those lines a bit more pronounced. All right, so my quilting is done. I will go ahead and tidy up the edges because the inner layer is linen, so it does sort of deform a little bit. And then I will also cut out these, and that's the reason why I didn't do that in the first place. And after that, I will add a little label. I think I will go with the one that says from my heart to yours. Now, you can of course put anything that you would like on your labels. You can also use your sewing machine to put something on your pouch. But if you've been looking for some really great sewing labels, then I do have a nice discount code for you in the description of this video. It is an affiliate link. I'm not hiding that, but I truly love these labels. I've been using them for a while. My friends have been using them for a while and uh, I've been really, really happy with the quality. So if you've been looking for some, there is a discount code for you so you can save a little bit of money. Once I have attached the label, now I have to finish this piece with just a straight stitch on one side and on the other side. Next, I'm going to fold it in half and cut it. And then I'm going to fold it in half again and place it on each side like so, right in the middle, and then stitch it down. The stitch is about a quarter of an inch away from the edge. Now I'm ready for the zipper. And this zipper, 16 inches long, is just a little bit longer than the top and it does make it easier to work with it. What I'm going to do next is I'll take my zipper, 
I will open this up. Currently it's facing face up. Now I'm going to turn it down and aligning the top of the zipper with a face down with the edge right over here. I'm going to first pin just here on top because it is actually easier for me to not to pin it all the way and just control it right as I sew. Switch your sewing machine to a zipper foot and now with 3 8 of an inch seam allowance let's attach the zipper. As you can see I do stop and then continue stitching quite often adjusting in the process and using my fingers in order to conform the zipper tape to the curve of the pouch. And this is what I have after completion and as you can see right now some of that seam allowance is peeking under the zipper tape ever so slightly. So right now I'm going to fold it away and use my scissors to trim it just the tiniest bit so that way we can be ready for the next step. Once done, I'm going to fold the zipper tape to the wrong side of the project like so. And now it hides all of that seam allowance and I'm going to top stitch right over here about a quarter of an inch from the edge of the fabric. For this I actually went back to my regular presser foot and just like previously I'm going to be using a regular straight stitch. The overall goal of this stitching is to secure the zipper and all of the raw edges underneath it so that way it's nice and neat and we don't have to do anything extra. Now let's attach the other side of the zipper. Again face down, placing the edge of the zipper with this edge and then continuing with all of the same steps that we did previously on this side. Once both sides of the zipper are done, now we have to form the corners. Let's start with this one first. So fold it in like so and the same with the other side and then let's stitch it across. When you're working on this make sure to avoid any metal parts of the zipper to not to damage your sewing machine or break the needle. Now here I did it about 3 8 of an inch away from the edge but you can always turn out the corner and see if you'd like to take a little bit more and if so do that. But remember you will need to repeat exactly the same steps on the other side as well. As a result I decided to do another row of stitches so in total I took about half an inch away from the edge. Now we can snip off the extra over here. Not too much just to tidy it up and the same we're going to do on this side. Next I'm going to grab leftover pieces of fabric and we're going to cover these raw edges. First I folded my piece of fabric like I would for a bias tape. Then I wrapped it around the raw edge of the zipper tape like so. Next I'm going to stitch across inside of the seam allowance. After it's done just snip off the extra on the angle like so and if you'd like you can add a few drops of fray check over here but these raw edges aren't really going to go anywhere as soon as you fold them in. Of course here I have to repeat the same on the other side but other than that it is done and ready. If you'd like you can add a little ring into one of the tabs, maybe a little ribbon into a zipper pull but that's it. Your pouch is ready to be gifted. Perhaps you want to make them as a batch for your farmer's market as I did for these little ones. If you batch it it goes even faster so I truly hope that you enjoyed this project. This next project is really great to do together with young ones. If you have kids, grandkids, nephews, nieces, friends, just bring them all in, do it together with them, show them that you can create something with your hands or with your sewing machine and you will see how that sparks that imagination, it sparks that creativity and it's priceless and hopefully it will ignite that love for creating and perhaps for sewing as well. I'm going to start with a simple shape and since I have a little girl we will do a heart and a great way to get your kids involved is to ask them to help you with cutting out the initial shape. We will need two of those, one for the front, one for the back. Please know that as I've traced my heart on the fabric I did add seam allowance to it. Mm -hmm. 
once we have both hearts cut, we're going to place them right sides together and then sew all the way around with a straight stitch about quarter of an inch seam allowance, leaving a small opening on one side for turning everything right side out. Before stitching this, grab a little piece of tool tape or perhaps you have a little ribbon, fold it in half to create a little loop and then place it like so in between making a little sandwich and you can also pin it so that way it doesn't move. Now sewing a small curved project like this on a sewing machine for kids can be quite challenging but it is actually way easier if you use hand sewing needle and thread and a blanket stitch. Once we're done sewing, let's go ahead and gray the seam allowances so that way it's easier to turn everything and clip the seam allowance in the dip of the heart. Then let's turn everything right side out, perhaps give it a really good press and then stuff it with pillow stuffing or anything else that you have to give it a little shape and fluff. Use hand sewing stitches to close up the little opening and that's another great opportunity to do it together with your little one. After that, the last and final step for us is to jazz it up. So I will grab some fabric glue and some rhinestones. I will give it to my kid and all of the creative freedom so that way she can truly express herself. As you can see, my daughter decided to do this on both sides and she calls it a disco heart. After that, just insert a little ring and now you have a heart keychain. Project number six can be a very versatile household item. You can make it from larger fabric scraps or from smaller ones. It's totally up to you. First, I'm going to share with you the principles of making a basket, and then I will guide you through how to create this beautiful grid from really small fabric scraps. Now, you really don't need much for this project. First, of course, you will need your fabric scraps, and I personally like to work with cotton, cotton linen blends, or 100% linen. I think that all three of those will give your basket that beautiful finished look. You will also need a little bit of fusible fleece or instead of that you can use a little bit of batting or perhaps some bag making interfacing that is nice and sturdy. This will be needed to give the basket a little bit of structure and stability. My first step is to cut six 10 by 10 inch squares. Two for the lining of the basket, two for the outside and two from fusible fleece or batting. Next, you will want to quilt or fuse your outer fabric to the fusible fleece or batting. In my case, this is just the batting, so I'm going to place one of the layers on top of the batting and decide how am I going to quilt it. In my case, I really like diagonal lines, so that's what I'm going to mark with a heat erasable pen. When it is time to get stitching, I like to start right in the middle and then I select a straight stitch and I usually increase the stitch length by a little bit so that way it goes easier and smoother through all of these layers. And don't forget that you will need to do the same on the other square as well. Once both of these are done, I'm going to give them a really good press to get rid of the heat erasable pen. Next, I'm going to cut out the bottom corners. This little square is two and a quarter inches by two and a quarter inches, and I'm going to place it like so, outline it, and then cut it out. Now this is what I'm going to have once done. Next step, we're going to repeat for both sets of the fabric. We're going to place them right sides together, aligning on all of the sides, and then with 3 eighths of an inch seam allowance, we're going to sew these sides, and after that, we're going to sew this side. I will be doing that with a straight stitch, starting with the back stitch and ending with the back stitch as well. Now I'm going to form these corners. While the project is still wrong side out, Go ahead and place it like so. You can also press the seam allowances open with your fingers, align them, pin and sew with the same 3 eighths of an inch seam allowance. We're going to repeat that on all corners. It is surely starting to look a little bit like a basket. Now leave the main fabric as is, the one that you have with fusible fleece or interfacing or with batting like I do. Turn out the other one, the lining, right side out and then place it inside aligning with the side seams. Here you will also want to press seam allowances open and then 
pin. You will do the same with the seams on the other side as well. Now you will pin everything else. However, you want to leave quite a generous opening right here. I would say about four inches or so for turning out the basket. The rest we will stitch with a straight stitch, back stitch at the beginning and at the end with the same 3 8 of an inch seam allowance. Now I am ready to turn this right side out. And one of the reasons why I leave a generous opening is because I find that if you leave the opening too small, once you're turning this right side out, it will stretch out the lining fabric and then it will be really hard to align it with the basket fabric and sew it together nicely. I'm just making sure here that I poke out all of those little corners. All right, looking good. The last and final step is going to be to top stitch the top of the basket. Here you will see that the lining will want to roll to the outside of the basket. So I start somewhere in the middle and I use my fingers to roll it back and then pin it and continue until you have reached the opening that we left in order to turn everything right side out. Once you have reached that opening here, I will need to press my seam allowances open again, neatly roll the raw edges to the inside and then pin it. This should make a really nice smooth transition so that opening wouldn't be visible. Now you will want to top stitch this with a straight stitch pretty close to the edge in order to catch both of these fabrics in the area where we have left it open. However, I actually like to finish this with a hand sewing stitches first and then do a wider top stitching all the way around about 3 8 of an inch. Now that I'm done with stitching, I just need to pop everything right side out and then as you can see right over here we just have to fold the rim of the basket a little bit over itself and that's it the basket is ready now let me show you how to do this version with this grid pattern to get this started i need a base layer of fabric this is just cotton poplin that i was using for some dye experiments it didn't necessarily dye the way i wanted it so now i'm using it for projects like these and if you take a look I have outlined a 10 by 10 inch square on this base layer. And then grab your fabric scraps and cut them in two by two inch squares, but you can also do three by three, four by four, five by five, or any other measurements. Next, I will use the fabric that I have cut to fill this square. Now it is time to prepare some bias tape to layer it on top of this grid. Now, if you're not a fan of making bias tape, using bias tape, or just having anything to do with that, I totally understand. I actually think that you will be able to use some twill tape instead of it as well. Plus, it will give you a nice texture for your basket. Now, a quick note about this. Since there's no need for this bias tape to actually be on the bias, I just cut straight strips of fabric scrap that I have. Each one of these, when I cut, is about one inch and a quarter wide. And once I press it and form it into a bias tape, it makes it out to be to about five eighths of an inch. Once I have pressed all of the fabric that I will need, we will actually do it one layer at a time. And this is probably the most fiddliest part of this entire process. I'm going to pin these strips of fabric at the intersection of each little square so that way nothing falls apart as I stitch them down. You can also use interfacing and fuse the little squares to the interfacing instead of using a little layer of fabric underneath. Whichever way is best for you, I prefer to do it this way, but interfacing will work as well. Once I have everything pinned, I am ready to stitch it down. As always, straight stitch, a little bit wider than usual, so that way it goes smooth through all of the layers. And it will take a little bit of time, but for me, completing both of these panels takes about an hour, stitching-wise. So it's not dramatic, it is a little bit fiddly at first, but once you get in the zone, it becomes quite fun putting these little fabric scraps together, uh, which otherwise probably would be just sitting there. So I think this is a fun way to use them up and, you know, play a little puzzle. And by the way,
way here I'm using a contrasting thread on top of my blue fabric but you don't have to that way if something isn't perfectly straight nobody will ever see it now I will grab my batting and I will place it underneath my project and I'm going to start layering the second pass of the tape and this time it's going to be a lot easier because all of the little squares are already secured so you can do these one by one in the same way as we did the first ones. After the final layer is done I like to give it a really good press it makes it look real nice and crisp and then I just need to bring it back to the 10 by 10 inch measurements by cutting away everything extra that I don't need. And from here, you're going to repeat all of the same steps as we did when we made this little basket. This is actually going to be a gift. Inside I have four kitchen towels, I also made them. And I think this is so cute, isn't it? This could also be a great idea to sew and sell. So possibilities are truly endless and I hope that you're going to give these little baskets a try. All right, our next project is also for your home and specifically for your kitchen. We're going to make a set of these really quick and easy pot holders. First, let's get started with the materials that we will need. We're going to be using all cotton thread and all cotton fabric. In my case, I went for two different prints, but you can of course work with all one fabric. It's totally up to you. The biggest square is going to be cut 10 by 10 inches. The smaller square is going to be cut eight by eight inches. I also like making sort of like a little pocket for the front to insert your hand for better grip. This one is five by eight inches. Then we will also need to cut two squares, one from all cotton batting, eight by eight inches, the other one from Insole Bright, also eight by eight inches. The first step for us is to make a sandwich. So grab the largest square, place it right side down, then grab your insole bright and with a shiny side, place it down right in the middle. Then we're going to grab cotton batting, place it right on top, and then we're going to grab the other part of the cotton fabric and place it right on top. Next, we will need to quilt it to keep the sandwich together. I have simply marked diagonal lines with a heat erasable pen all in one direction. And we're going to start our quilting not from the edge of the smaller square, but from the edge of the larger one. So from here all the way to the edge of the larger square. And we're going to repeat that on all of the lines that I have marked. Now here I really wanted to urge you to read all of the information when it comes to using new materials like for example Insole Bright. Make sure that you familiarize yourself with how much heat can it take, how to work with it, what you can and cannot do with it. Also, when you're sewing with so many layers, make sure to increase the stitch length. That way it's going to go a little bit easier. And this is what we're going to have once done. And as you can see, the batting underneath shifted a little bit. It does happen to me on and off. So if it happens to you as well, don't feel frustrated. It's still very much a workable piece and we'll be able to do it without a problem. Next, let's move on to this little piece. Let's finish one of the edges. We're going to place it wrong side up, fold it in quarter of an inch once, and quarter of an inch one more time. And then let's secure it with two rows of straight stitching. Next, place this piece on the bottom. And right here, we're going to fold this edge in all the way to the edge of the smaller square. And then once more, give it a little bit of a press so that way it holds everything together. And we're going to top stitch it right here on the edge. We're going to repeat all of the same steps on the top, but this time we're going to add a little loop of twill tape so that way it acts like a little hook that you can hang these pot holders in your kitchen. Once you're done stitching down the top, fold it back and stitch over it one more time to secure it in place like so. As a last and final step, fold in the sides and stitch them down exactly the same way as we did on the bottom and the top. And there you have it, we made a set of pot holders. From the right side, they look like this, and from the wrong side, they look like this. This little 
pouch or you can also call it a mini wallet it comes together in about 10 minutes and it's a really great project for all those beautiful fabric scraps that you have I personally really like using cotton for projects like these, so those are the fabric scraps that I'm grabbing. You can also do one color on the inside, one color on the outside, and a third color all around the edges, so you can definitely combine different fabric scraps that you have. Now to give your mini wallet shape and stability so that way it doesn't flop around and retain its structure, you will also need some sort of interfacing. Now I have found this bag making and decor interfacing by Pellon. Obviously in different countries you have different types of interfacings. So the rule of thumb is that you want something that is nice and sturdy. Here's an extra tip. If you're making these mini pouches from cork fabric or perhaps leather or faux leather, then in most cases you don't need interfacing and you also don't need to finish the raw edges because these materials don't fray. First, I like to start by cutting the template for the mini wallet out of the interfacing. You can find the measurements for the template right here on your screen and draft your own. Or if you are a member of this channel, then you do have a printable template as a part of your membership. Next, let's find a good fabric scrap. I will give it a good press first and then I will fuse the interfacing to it. In this particular case and project, the grain line doesn't really matter. Next, of course, let's cut it out. After that, we will also need to cut a one piece for the lining for the inside of the little pouch. This time, we don't have to fuse it to the interfacing. Now, let's place the lining on top of the interfacing and the first thing that we're going to do is to finish this little edge with a bias tape. This bias tape is one inch and a quarter wide and about seven inches long. Let's take our fabric sandwich, place it like this so the lining the wrong side is facing up. Take your bias tape, place it like so and let's head to the sewing machine. Here with a quarter of an inch seam allowance, we're going to stitch the bias tape along the curve. And as you can see, I'm using my fingers in order to help shape the bias tape, but I'm not stretching it. Also, don't forget to start and end with a back stitch. This is what we're going to have once done. Now, flip it to the right side, grab the bias tape, fold it like so over the original stitching line covering it. And now let's top stitch. To make it even easier, you can always give your bias tape a little press before this step. And as always, don't forget to start and end with the back stitching. Now, when it comes to the closure, you can opt for whatever you already have at home. So here you see a couple of examples, including a snap and a Velcro. If you're using Velcro just like I am, our next step is to attach one of these little squares right in the middle, about a quarter of an inch underneath the stitching of the bias tape. Let's stitch a little frame inside of this Velcro in order to secure it in place. After Velcro is attached, we will need to fold our little pouch. So grab your template, mark the fold line, and then fold. Then grab another piece of bias tape. The width is the same as previously, an inch and a quarter, and the length is about 18 inches. I will take my pouch, I will flip it over like so. I will take my bias tape, Place it right sides together, a little bit hanging off of the edge. Then I will fold it like so and head to the sewing machine. I'm going to use the same quarter of an inch seam allowance as we did previously. And because we are sewing through many layers of fabric and interfacing, it will be easier if you do increase your stitch length. As you can see, I'm still using my fingers in order to shape the bias tape around the curve. And once you reach the bottom, go ahead, snip off the bias tape and fold it under just like we did at the very beginning. This is what I have once it's done. Make sure that all of the sides are caught in the seam. Now grab the bias tape from the back and pull it to the front. Starting on one of the sides, we're going to fold the bias tape over the original stitching line and press. Now we're going to take this to the sewing machine and top stitch just like we did previously. Once top stitching is done, fold the upper flap down and the very last step for us to do is to attach another little square of Velcro and then that's it, your mini wallet is done. 
Now I must say that at times it might be a little bit tricky to get a nice stitching line on the other side of the bias tape, but I do find that if you stick to a really nice and even seam allowance, and then if you press everything real neat, that usually it does come out looking good. Also, if you just use the same fabric and a really nice matching thread, then it's almost impossible to see that stitching line and you don't really have to worry about it much. You can also vary these in sizes and make them bigger if you need to. So I truly hope that you found this useful. This next project is so easy, it doesn't even involve a sewing machine. As you have seen, I have already made a couple of sets that I really, really like. And right now I need to make an extra one for this pink one. So what we're going to do is we're gonna go ahead and grab our little template, our little square that is approximately four by four inches or 10 by 10 centimeters. Go ahead and fold it like so then like so, just like you would when we were doing snowflakes when we were kids, if you remember. So there we go, we have folded it in. Then what we want to do, I'm gonna take my previous template, you just wanna round up the corners. So you want to create like a little flower. There we go, because that's exactly what we're making. So this is how it would look. And now we also want to make sure that we cut a circle in the middle. So here's my template again, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna cut this one off. There we go. So now when you open this up, so let's take a look. When we open this up, it's gonna give us that flower shape that we're after. And if you want, you can always adjust it a little bit. So for example, in my case, I definitely wanna make sure that I Curve these in just a little bit more because I want those petals to be just slightly more pronounced. There we go. Take your fabric scraps and let's go ahead and fold them. So instead of cutting actual squares, what I usually do is I just go ahead and fold them in like so, like so, because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if it's a square or if you're folding fabric just like that. There we go. All you want to make sure is that you get that corner. And then you go ahead and you take that template, place it right over here so that way the sides of the template align with the sides of your folded corner. And then we're gonna go ahead and we are going to cut. So first you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna cut the petal shape. There we go. And after that, you're gonna go ahead and you're going to cut the inner circle. There we go. Once done, set it aside. And for each of the flowers, we need to cut three of those. So I need to cut two extra. Here I'm using knit fabric, so fabric with stretch, because usually once you cut that fabric, it doesn't fray, therefore you don't have to worry about it. But you can of course use some woven fabric as well. You might apply some fray check, which is a liquid that seals the edges of the fabric so it doesn't fray. All right, now that we have cut all three petals, this is what we want to do next. Take each one of them and lay them flat. There we go. And if one is a little bit bigger than the other, that actually plays in your favor because then you get a really nice kind of like dimensional uh, flower. So what we want to do right now is we want to layer them one on top of another, aligning the inner circle just like you see me do on a screen. Once done, go ahead and grab your hand sewing needle and thread, and we want to do a basting stitch or a gathering stitch right around the circumference of this corner. So make sure that you tie a knot, and let's go ahead and do that. And this is so easy and so fun. You can do this with your kids, with your grandkids. You can do this to sell at a farmer's market. You can make these as gifts, as stocking stuffers. So many possibilities. I made these as little Easter gifts for kids at my daughter's daycare. So I truly think that this could be a great way how to reuse your fabric scraps and really make the most out of them and something beautiful as well. Once done, go ahead and pull on the thread so that we can gather the flower. There we go, nice and neat. And now let's go ahead and secure the thread and the knots so that way nothing goes anywhere. And we're going to be ready for the next step.
Next step is that we gotta do the middle. So here you see I have the pink one, here I have the yellow one. For that, you can buy rhinestones. These are from Joann's and I don't necessarily like them too much. I would like them to be a little bit more sparkly, but this will do for now. If you have some beautiful flat buttons that you know that you're not going to use for anything else, you can also use those as well. This could be a great alternative and also will help you use them as well. Then you want to go ahead and grab your hot glue gun, drop a little bit right in the middle of the flower. Grab the center of the flower of your choice and place it right on top, right over there. Then go ahead and grab these. These are the empty bases for the clips. There we go, I got them on Amazon. If you're interested, I will leave the link for you guys in the info box below. Now, as you can see, these are exactly the same that I've used right over here. Now, you don't have to make it into a clip. You can make it as a decoration for an already existing garment. You can make it as something that you would put like on a skirt. So many opportunities. So definitely think about it, play around with it. But what we want to do next is we we want to attach the back of the flower right over here. And what I like to do is I just like to put a line of hot glue right over here. Just like this. All right. And then we're going to go ahead and take our flower and we're going to place it right on top. There we go. Then I flip it over and I press it so that way we know for sure that it sticks. Hold it together just for a second. And you don't have to use hot glue. If you have any other glue that will do the job, you can also use that as well. And that's it. Our beautiful clip is ready to go. Let's talk about fabric and of course scraps are great for this project and I like to use anything that has a really nice silky feel to it. Real silk is great if you have some fabric remnants that you're not going to be using anymore. Satin is also one of my favorites. Viscose can be great for scrunchies as well, but it does crease over time, but still you can make a beautiful scrunchie. And I would avoid anything that has a very textured feel to it, like for example, linen. These are of course my preferences, so you can use whatever you would like. So give different fabrics a try and see how it works out. When it comes to elastic, mine is about 3 eighths of an inch wide or a little bit over one centimeter. I usually cut my elastic to be between eight and nine inches long. This one is about eight and a half and so is this one that I used in this example. When it comes to fabric, this way I have about four inches and that will give you a scrunchie that looks like this. And if you want a scrunchie that's bigger and puffier, then go for five inches and more. This way I usually aim for about 50 inches plus or minus 10 inches here and there depending on how much fabric I have. This time I also have it cut as one continuous piece but it doesn't have to be. You can always compile it from multiple fabric scraps. You know, I'm actually going to swap out these fabric scraps so that way you can see the difference between the right and the wrong side of the fabric a little bit better. Because the first step for us is going to be to bring together the long ends of the fabric, right sides together, and stitch them. But we want to leave about two inches on each side unsewn. I'm going to start sewing at the two inch mark starting with a back stitch. The seam allowance here is about three eighths of an inch and we're going to do it just with a straight stitch. This is definitely a great project to practice your finger pinning since it comes together so quickly and easily. And if you're sewing with lightweight fabrics and you see that your straight stitch produces puckers, if you reduce the stitch length, that will definitely help. Now that we have stitched it all together, leaving two inches unsewn on one side and on the other side, we need to push it inside itself. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to push some of that fabric inside of the casing. I'm going to take my ruler, 
and I'm going to continue pushing it, but I don't want to push it all the way out. I don't want to turn it right side out. I actually want the ends to meet. So right here, I have the other end inside. I want to take the ruler out. We don't need it anymore. Let's bring it back. So the seams facing each other because we want to make sure that we don't twist it. We want to bring these ends together like so. And that's what we want to stitch with a straight stitch starting and ending with a back stitch with the same 3 eighths of an inch seam allowance. Now that that is done, we want to pull the casing just a little bit further. We're still not pulling it out. We want to pull it just a little bit further. And so far we have quite a large opening over here. So we want to reduce it. We're going to align the seams and we're going to stitch it almost closed, leaving about half an inch opening. When you do this, make sure that you don't catch any extra fabric in the seam. And as always, we're going to start and end with a back stitch using a straight stitch. Now this half an inch little opening might seem like quite a small one, but if your fabric is nice and slinky, it will be just enough to pull all the scrunchy right side out. like this. Now grab your elastic and a large safety pin and thread through like this. After that, insert the large safety pin into the half inch opening and start pushing the elastic through. Once I have reached the end of the elastic, I do like to sort of pin it down so that way I don't lose it. And then I continue putting the elastic through until I make my way all the way around. Once you have reached the other end, Get your elastic out of the scrunchie, overlap the ends, and then zigzag over them quite a few times to secure elastic in place. Once that is done, I simply get the elastic back into the scrunchie, and because that opening was so small and a scrunchie is quite thick, we will never be able to find it again, so I leave it unsewn. I think it could make a really great combination and a gift together with those taco pouches that we also made from fabric scraps in one of the previous videos. And if you want to see more ideas for gifts to sew for upcoming holiday season, then click on the video that you see right on your screens. I thank you so, so much for watching. I truly hope you got some great ideas and inspiration. And until next time, happy, thoughtful sewing. I'll see you soon. Bye.